Good morning. This is an encouraging. It's like a full house for, for us here. And it is encouraging to know that there are some folks that are listening. Um, God evidently is pleased for us to hear some things twice. If you would, turn with me to Isaiah 51. But I'm going to be saying the same exact thing as Joe said. Isaiah 51, and I'm going to read the whole chapter. Hearken to me, ye that follow after righteousness, ye that seek the Lord, look unto the rock whence ye were hewn, and to the hole of the pit whence ye are digged. Look unto Abraham your father, and unto Sarah that bear, bear you, for I called him alone, and blessed him, and increased him. For the Lord shall comfort Zion, he will comfort all her waste places, and he will make her wilderness like Eden, and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness shall be found therein, thanksgiving and the voice of melody. Hearken unto me, my people, and give ear unto me, O my nation, for a law shall proceed from me, and I will make my judgment to rest for a light of the people. My righteousness is near my salvation. My righteousness is near. My salvation is gone forth, and mine arms shall judge the people. The isles shall wait upon me, and on mine arms shall they trust. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, and look upon the earth beneath. For the heavens shall vanish away like smoke, and the earth shall wax old like a garment, and they that dwell therein shall die in like manner. But my salvation shall be forever, and my righteousness shall not be abolished. Hearken unto me, ye that know righteousness. The people in whose heart is my law, fear ye not the reproach of men, neither be ye afraid of their revelings. For the moth shall eat them up like a garment, and the worm shall eat them like wool. But my righteousness shall be forever, and my salvation from generation to generation. Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake, as in the ancient days, in the generations of old. Art thou not it that hath cut Rahab and wounded the dragon? Art thou not it which hath dried the sea, the waters of the great deep, that hath made the depths of the sea a way for the ransom to pass over? Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion, and everlasting joy shall be upon their head. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. I, even I, am he that comforteth you. Who art thou that thou shouldest be afraid of a man that shall die, and of the son of man which shall be made as grass? And forgettest the Lord thy maker, that hath stretched forth the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth, and has feared continually every day because of the fury of the oppressor, as if he were ready to destroy. And where is fury of the oppressor? The captive exile hasteneth that he may be loosed, and that he should not die in the pit, nor that his bread should fail. But I am the Lord thy God that divided the sea, whose waves roared. The Lord of hosts is his name. And I have put my words in my, thy mouth, and I have covered thee in the shadow of mine hand, that I may plant the heavens, and lay the foundations of the earth, and say unto Zion, Thou art my people. Awake, awake, stand up, O Jerusalem, which hast drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of his fury. Thou hast drunken the dregs of the cup of trembling, and wrung them out. There is none to guide her among all the sons whom she hath brought forth, Neither is there any that taketh her by the hand of all the sons that she hath brought up. These two things are coming to thee. Who shall be sorry for thee? 
desolation and destruction and the famine and the sword, by whom shall I comfort thee? Thy sons have fainted. They lie at the head of all the streets as a wild bull in a net. They are full of the fury of the Lord, the rebuke of thy God. Therefore hear now this, thou afflicted and drunken, but not with wine. Thus saith thy Lord the Lord. Thus saith thy Lord the Lord. And thy God that pleadeth the cause of his people. Behold, I have taken out of thine hand the cup of trembling, even the dregs of the cup of my fury. Thou shalt no more drink it again. But I will put it into the hand of them that afflict thee, which have said to thy soul, soul Bow down, that we may go over. And thou hast laid thy body as the ground and as the street to them that went over. What a great comfort to God's people this passage is. The God of all comfort is here telling us where our comfort comes from. First of all, we were cut from a rock. Oh, to be cut from a rock, to be hewn from a rock, a rock that is unmovable. If I am one of these that God, the Lord Almighty, speaks about here in this passage, I am cut from something unmovable. This is God's rock. He says here that he will comfort us. That just comforts me knowing that he, God Almighty, has been pleased to give us comfort. He is an almighty God, a consuming fire. Yet there are some for whom he has been pleased to comfort us. You can read that in verse 3 and verse 12. It says in verse 4, His judgment shall rest for a light of the people. Thank God for that. Amen. We are also told in this passage not to fear men or what they can, can or will do in verses 7 and verses 12 and 13. We are not to fear men. God has men just where he wants them. No man will do anything to me that God Almighty has not already determined for them to do. They will go no further, but they will do as he has purposed for them to do. If that means that I die from it, it will be over, and they will do me no hurt anymore. It says elsewhere in Scripture that I should fear God who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Standing here preaching, I have nothing to fear but this. Woe is to me if I preach not the gospel. God help me to do that. What I want to concentrate on today is the, the first verse. I do not have anything new. Joe's already given the, the deep doctrine, so I don't have any deep doctrine for you or anything that is necessarily deep. It has been preached here before. I just want to go through it once again and remind us of this truth. We are told first to look at the rock from whence ye are hewn and to the hole of the pence, pit whence we were digged. So I want to look at the rock whence we were hewn and the pence, the pit whence we are digged. First, the rock whence we were hewn. The rock in this passage is a boulder. This is a large rock, a place of refuge. Does this bring anything to mind? If you're like me, you know who this is referring to. But I want to be clear to everybody hearing me, anybody out there that's hearing me, this rock is not my wife. Yeah. This rock is not my kids. Yeah. This rock is not my mother, and it was not my dad. This rock is not my sister. This rock is not my brother. This rock is neither of my pastor, Walter or Joe. This rock is not this assembly or the church building. Although I care about all of these things, that's not what holds me up. And I want to tell you about this rock, the rock being spoken of in this passage. And if you would, turn with me to Exodus chapter 33. Exodus chapter 33, if you want to follow along. Verses 13 through 23.
Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, shew me now thy way, that I may know thee, that I might, may find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. And he said, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. And he said unto him, If thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not in, in that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. And he, and he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Amen. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. And it shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in a cliff of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. Amen. The rock spoken of here is where we are hid, a cleft of the rock, where we can see the glory of God. This is the rock that I'm speaking of. If you have any other rock, you are mistaken. It's not really a rock. If your rock is not this rock, it will not cover you from the all-consuming glory of God the Father. Only in the cleft of this rock, this boulder, will you be able to behold the glory of God. This rock is God's rock, and nothing you come up with as being your rock. God has to place you in this cleft of the rock. We read about this rock in other places. In Exodus 17, 6 we read, Behold, I will stand before thee, there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock. And there shall come out water, come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders. There came a time when this rock would be smitten with judgment of God in my place. Because of this smiting, there comes forth the water of life. All those who are around this rock are given drink by this rock. This water comes from this rock. So the rock is what I want to fix my eyes on. The rock is what gives the water. So if you do not know the rock, there will be no lasting water for you. You may be blessed of God because you are around others who know this rock, because the rock is around his people. But if you are not adoring the rock, there will come a day when the water dries up for you. In Numbers 20, verses 7 through 12, I want to read that. Numbers 20, 7 through 12. <clears throat> and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the rod, and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth his water, and thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock. So thou shalt give the congregation and their beasts drink. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock. And he said unto them, Hear now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice. And the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank and their beast also. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, Because ye believe me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. The thing that I want to note here at this time, this same rock was smitten 
once by God's law already. That's what the indication is. Moses is, stands for the law, and he already had smoked the rocks one, rock once. And he was told here to just speak to the rock. We read it in Exodus 17. This rock was made a curse for us on behalf of his people and was smoked one time and one time only for all time. He died once under the judgment of God's law on his people's behalf, and he will not be smitten a second time. This one time was enough to get the job done. If you are attempting to keep God's law for righteousness before him, you are saying to God what was done to his rock was not good enough, and you are trying to strike the rock again. Because this rock was already struck once, all we now have to do is speak to the rock that we might be filled. Who is this rock? We've talk, been talking about rocks and boulders. What is this rock that I'm telling each and every one that hears my voice they should be crying out to for living water? If you want to turn with me, turn with me to uh, 1 Corinthians 10. All familiar things that everyone's heard here before. 1 Corinthians 10. Verses 1 through 4, 1 Corinthians 10. <clears throat> Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Amen. <clears throat> we all know who this rock is. The scripture has told us all who this rock is. The rock that scripture is speaking about is Jesus Christ, the Lord. And it behooves me to speak of that rock, which is Christ. This rock that was to be smote once is he that came in the form of a servant, the one who was God manifest in the flesh. This rock walked this earth and fulfilled the law every jot and tittle. He was a just man, but he died being made sin for me. Yes. I cannot speak for you, but I know this. The scripture says he was made sin for me that I, even I, would be made the righteousness of God in him. Amen. He went to that cross bearing the guilt of my <coughs> sin because he was made sin. The father having turned his back on him, I will never know that because he himself experienced that for me. We all want to experience salvation. That's a part of salvation I don't want to experience. But that is a part of salvation, and Christ did that for us. Those of us who are God's people will never experience the forsaking of God. Why is that? Because the rock of our salvation experienced it for us. The law condemns us to death, but if this rock that is Jesus Christ was made a curse for you, then you are dead to the law. That law struck Jesus Christ so that I would not have to be struck. Amen. Scripture is filled with words telling us who this rock of salvation is. What does Scripture say? We just read that Paul told us the rock was Christ, and that's really good enough, but we have other Scriptures telling us this. Let's read them. 2 Samuel twenty-two thirty-two. it says, For who is God? save the Lord. And who is a rock? Save our God. Psalms 18.2 says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. Here is the rock from whence I was hewn and here is what that rock did for me. In Psalms 40 and verse 2 it says, He brought me up also out 
of an horrible pit out of the miry clay and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. So this rock from whence I was hewn digged me from a horrible pit and set my feet on this unmovable rock. So what was this pit that I should remember? And just a uh, note here, it says, look to the pit from whence you were digged, not try to go back into it. Yeah. This pit is a pit of corruption, a pit of no water and no bread, a pit of death. The pit that we were digged from is a pit that we made ourselves. It is a horrible pit. God created Adam upright. Adam disobeyed God and plunged all of us into this pit of total darkness. If we remain in that pit, we will forever perish. This is a pit of man's ways. And what are some of those ways? One is a pit of free will religion. A religion that esteems man rather than God. It is a pit of law keeping where those who are in the pit, they believe they can build a ladder to God or something by working their way up to God, keeping the law to dig themselves out of the pit. That pit of filthy rags in God's sight. This pit is a pit of all unrighteousness. Fornication, idolatry, adultery, effeminate, abusers of themselves with mankind, thievery, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners, and anything else like this. This is us by nature because t Paul tells us which were some of you. He does say were. So if God has digged you out of this pit, then you are no longer that, but we must remember that pit from whence we were dead. Yeah. We are so dece deceived by our own trap that even those who have been digged from the pit must be reminded <coughs> to not be wise in our own conceits, and that is to think some your self-worth about yourself, that you have some kind of self-worth because you have none. We are told not to be high-minded. That is arrogant. We are to be reminded about these things because we were digged from a pit and we did not dig ourselves out of this pit. That's right. What God sees in man is this. In Genesis 6, 5 we read, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. This was man back then, and it is man now by nature. Yes, sir. You might think of yourself as being a pretty good person, but in God's sight, you are in a hor horrible pit of which you must be digged out. This pit is our own sinful heart. It is who we are by nature. This pit, the pit that we are digged from, is a pit with a snare that we created ourselves and we will be caught in our own trap. Psalm 7 and verse 15 says, He made a pit and digged it and is fallen into the ditch which he made. Psalms 9.15 says, The heathen are sunk down in the pit that they made. In the net which they hid is their own foot taken. And again in Psalms 9.16 it says, the Lord is known by the judgment which he executeth. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. We cannot get ourselves out of this pit. We have to be digged out of this pit. There is no way to get out of the pit unless someone else does the digging. We by nature are in this pit. It is not that we will fall into this pit if, the, this pit was created in our federal head, Adam, and he plunged us into this horrible pit. But God be thanked, there are some who were hewn from a rock first, and those are told to look to this pit from whence they were digged. You were not digged from this pit based on how good you were or are. 
You were digged from the pit simply because the rock was pleased to dig you from this pit if you were digged from the pit at all. Yes, sir. We have already read it. He brought me up also out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my going. He did this, as we've already heard, being made sin for us, for those who are hewn from the rock. Isaiah 38, 17 says, Behold, for peace I had great bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption. For thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. Man in his pit will never figure out God. Man in his pit will never seek God. Yeah. Scripture yeah. says that man's thoughts are not God's thoughts, and man's ways are not God's ways. His thoughts and ways are far higher than ours. His thoughts and ways are bound up in the rock, Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. O oh God, the rock of my salvation, please keep my mind set on this rock the rock of my salvation, the rock where the refreshing water flows freely, the wa rock wherein I am hid, the rock of my righteousness. May it please God that he will cause me to look unto this rock from whence I was hewn and to the print, pit, pit from whence I was dead. Help me to remember that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And that I was born a corrupt as I could possibly be born, as I could possibly be. And he, unless he places my feet on this solid ground, the rock of my salvation, I will remain in the pit. I pray God keeps on reminding me that I have nothing that I was not given. In other, other words, everything that I have comes from God, no matter what it is. Help me to remember that. And I just want to leave you with this last verse, Psalm 61 and verse 2. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee, when my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Amen. <clears throat> Dear Lord God, keep us looking unto Christ, our only hope of salvation, dear Lord. But never let us forget, dear Lord, the pit from whence we were digged. Dear Lord God, we know you have all powerful, all power, and can do what you want, dear Lord. May it be that you will open a poor sinner's eyes, heart, mind, to see the rock of their salvation. All these things we ask in Christ's name. Amen.